if the universe is infinite, which it may well be, in fact, there are many ways the universe can be infinite, then that would happen. If it's in accord with the laws of physics, then it can happen. And everything that can happen in an infinite universe will happen because the universe is formally infinite. So I contend in an infinite universe, it, even the most unlikely possibility must happen. In fact, formally an infinite number of times. It is one of the more widely accepted theories about hominin evolution, as they call it, it is that climate change played a, a key role. And actually there's, in my latest series, Human Universe, we, we, we focused on a, a theory which links the climate change, particularly in the Rift Valley, because we, we know that the big jumps in brain size all occurred in the Rift Valley of Africa. And it's quite remarkable, actually. And that, that's broadly speaking accepted, I think. Although there's a lot of argument with anthropologists because the, the data is sparse, you know. But it's broadly accepted there. And it seems that the big jumps in um, brain size occurred at times when the Earth's orbit was most elliptical. So the Earth's orbit oscillates, it becomes more elliptical and more circular and there are many different oscillations driven by gravitational interaction with the planets, like Jupiter in particular. And it seems like when the, the Earth's orbit is most elliptical, that the rate of climate change in the Rift Valley is, is, is higher and more extreme. And it seems to be the case that there's relatively strong evidence for the case that when you get these really rapid times of climate change, then you get increases in hominin brain size, therefore increases in intelligence. There's a big, big one 1.8 million years ago which was a very big increase in the number of species in the Rift Valley, um, of which Homo erectus was one of them, which eventually led to us, and a big, a big jump in brain size as well. And this was at a time when there was there's strong evidence for rapid climate change in that region. So that makes sense, like the adaptability of these animals, experimenting with new food sources, trying out new hunting methods. They A lot of them change from herbivore to omnivore, a lot of the, the primates that were observed, right? Well, it, it get, that's where it gets controversial when you look at the academic research, because sort of Darwinian idea that so you get this pressure from climate change but then what's the selection effect because climate change happens over many generations it doesn't happen over one generation so so the, the question is well what what actually is doing the selecting what are we selecting for why is this group uh, more likely to breed and be more successful if it's more intelligent so some people say well it's because we they were forced into groups so it's group dynamics it's the fact that you end up with bigger tribes you know hundreds of individuals cooperating together and that's what's been selected for and you need to be intelligent for that some people say as you said that it's more it's adaptability so maybe they have to learn to go fishing or they have to learn to eat the particular different crops and then maybe that's right. so that's a big area of debate about what might have been the the, the the selection pressure this precise selection pressure but it does seem pretty nailed down that climate change certainly in that region of africa in ethiopia and tanzania and through the rift valley uh, had played a role in, in driving us towards intelligence and it's interesting so that the size scale is very small by the way i mean so you go back four million years and you'll it, things like australopithecus are around which are basically upright chimpanzees the brain is not much bigger than a modern day chimp but then you go to 200,000 years ago and that's when homo sapiens first emerged just over 200,000 years which is not very long ago and it's quite remarkable actually and the modern theory is they get they spread out of africa about 60,000 years ago and they made it into Europe about 43,000 years ago or so, into the North America and South America only 15,000 years ago. So it's a very, it's a, quite a rapid spread. And the fact that we've only been around as a species for at most a quarter of a million years, a quarter of one million years is quite remarkable. I think the characteristics of black holes, the physics inside black holes is not understood. We, we don't know. Our theories don't work. We need what's called a quantum theory of gravity to make progress there. So that's the unification of quantum theory and relativity uh, and general relativity, um, which is what string theory is an attempt to do, but we don't know whether that's the right theory. So, so, so we, we, this is the edge of knowledge. So we don't know. So we don't know what, we, we, we don't know how to describe black holes properly. We don't so have a theory hole. that's capable of describing. We can describe the edge. So this thing about an event horizon and all that stuff, that works. That, that's not a problem in Einstein's theory. So the idea that if you have a sufficiently dense object, then it, that there's a region around it um, out of which light can't escape. 
because space and time are too curbed for light to get out. That's that's fine. The theory describes that properly. But when you go when you start asking questions about what happens at the centre of a black hole, the singularity, the, the very idea it's called a singularity tells you there are infinities in the theory. The theory is doing things. It's infinitely dense. It's infinitely small. It's well, no, it won't be. It. it that we don't have infinities in general in nature other than perhaps the size of the universe as you say but so so, so um so there's something going on there but we don't have the physical theory we don't have the tools to, to describe it it's an active area of research so i don't know is a good answer in science right and, and so speculation's fun but but ultimately you know we're talking about we're talking about a regime of nature uh which 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 our current theories are not capable of describing with any authority. And that's that's the inside of a black hole. So this is a picture, a baby picture of the universe. 180,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe became transparent for the first time to light. And that's because it was, it was cooling down as it was expanding and cooling, then atoms form. And at that moment, very, very quickly, uh, the universe becomes transparent. And so photons of light can travel on through the universe and they've been doing so ever since. And we can take a photograph of that and we have done with a series of satellites, the most recent which, of which is called Planck, which is a European satellite that's up there. So this is a picture, a baby picture of the universe as it was 380,000 years after the Big Bang. It's a very beautiful picture. But in explaining that, uh, that's given support to theories called inflationary cosmology theories. So inflationary cosmology theories say that before the universe was hot and dense, which we tend to call the, the Big Bang, before that the universe was, was still there and it was doing something else, which was an exponential expansion. So it was expanding exponentially fast, way faster than the speed of light. Then it stops and all the energy that was, that was causing that expansion gets dumped into space, heats it up, and that's what we see as the particles and energy today. So those theories are kind of interesting. But they also suggest that there are um, that there's a, there are theories called eternal inflation theories that say, well, how long did that period of expansion go on for? And does it all stop at once or does it stop in patches? And if it stops in patches, you get, if it stops in a little patch, you'd get a big bang and a universe. And it stops in another patch, you get another big bang and another universe. And a universe. So, so, so th these theories suggest perhaps there are an infinite number possibly, of, of, of big bangs, in inverted commas, which would mean there are an infinite number of universes like ours, um, and they're being created now, all the time, and they will continue to be created forever. So you get this fractal multiverse, ever-growing, exponentially fast. And really, bizarrely, th those theories have some support from the from the cosmic microwave background. They're theories that explain the structures we see. I should just underline the fact that this is speculative in a sense but it but it's um but it's relatively mainstream that but it what, what one of my colleagues noticed and some physicists have noticed is if you were some kind of omnipotent deity programmer and you wanted to run what's called a monte carlo simulation to say well i'll vary the strength of gravity in one universe and vary the mass of the electron in another one and vary these physical constants and see what happens then this is probably the kind of thing you'd do <laughs> this is what it would kind of look like <laughs> so that you can make an argument that the universe it, in some sense looks like one of these kind of so-called Monte Carlo simulations because it, it, it gives you the possibility of generating every possible number of r different ratios of the strengths of the forces of nature and all these things. So, so I, I just have to emphasize this is way out there way on out the there. edge, but it's fun. And what, what is fun and interesting though is that the, the wind all the way back, the inflationary cosmology bit is probably the most widely accepted theory at the moment for how the universe got to be the way it is. And it does lend itself to this idea that there may be a multiverse and, and it may be that in, in each different pocket universe, if you like, you can have different physical constants. So most of them wouldn't allow life to exist but some of them would. So, so our universe looks very fine-tuned if you look at it, in a sense. It looks like that the, the laws of nature were very slightly different. You wouldn't get carbon, for example, produced in stars in, in large quantities, which you need in order to, and when the stars die, the carbon and the oxygen come out and they recollapse into another generation of stars and solar systems, and that's how you get the heavy elements that make up our bodies. And So all those things look, you, you need... You, you either try and find an explanation for, for why the laws of nature are the way they are, or you go to one of these multiverse theories and say, well, actually, every possibility occurs in nature. And then we shouldn't, shouldn't be surprised that we live in a universe that seems fine-tuned for life. 
seems perfect for us to exist in because every possible combination of the laws of nature exists somewhere. And th this is where cosmology is at the moment. It's, this is genuine. You could go and onto the web and Google it. You'll find a, a, a thousand review papers on what's called inflationary cosmology. And it is cool and interesting, actually. Infinite numbers of infinite universes. Uh, these theories exist. We say the universe began 13.8 billion years ago. That's a measurement So because we can measure the speed that all the galaxies are flying away from us, essentially. You can run time backwards, if you like, to, to find out when they were all on top of each other. And so it's a quite a simple measurement and we've done that. So we say the universe began 13.8 billion years ago. But actually, all we know really was the universe was very hot and very dense at that time. And we have some theories that the universe was in existence before that, and perhaps some sort of circumstantial evidence. And that means that actually the universe could have always been eternal. When I talk to people, some people get upset about that. Some people would rather it had a beginning. The idea that it might have been around forever is more frightening somehow than the fact that it began. What terrifies you the most, an eternal universe or a finite universe? If you look to the LHC, which is the Large Hadron Collider, which is the place where we generate the highest energy, so it's the biggest microscope in the world in that sense, we have an extremely good understanding of the laws of physics at that level. Um, it, it, up to and including the discovery of the Higgs particle. Just that, has that been proven? Is that oh, yes, in the debate discovered. at all? There is a particle there that we've discovered, and it has all the right properties to be the, the predicted standard model Higgs particle. Please, please explain what that um, means. What so the Higgs particle, it was predicted back in the 60s by Peter Higgs and others, and it's uh, the idea is basically that early on in the expansion history of the universe, so let's say less than a billionth of a second after the Big Bang, as the universe cooled, it went through something condensed out into empty space. So people call it a phase transition. or But it's analogous to a window pane on a cold winter's day. It's analogous to, to water vapour condensing out into ice. As you drop the temperature, it changes into something else, into ice. So in the same way that the theory is that as the universe cooled, something condensed out. So empty space isn't empty. It's full of Higgs particles, if you like, or a Higgs field. So every bit, so this means this space. Now it's not just space between the galaxies, it's in this room that every square meter of this room is full of the Higgs field. And our fundamental particles, the electrons, let's say, in our bodies, interact with that Higgs field. And in that process, they acquire mass. So it's the, it's the mass generation mechanism. It's why some particles are massive, like electrons and quarks, and some things like photons are not massive. They're massless, and they travel through the universe at the speed of light. So that's the theory. Now, that was suggested and built uh, mathematically, essentially. There was very little evidence for it at the time, back in the 60s. But over the years, uh, it, the theory called the standard model of particle physics passed all experimental tests. So we got to the point where we thought, right, okay, we, we will build a machine that will either disprove or prove that theory. And the LHC is such a machine. If that theory is correct, which it now seems to be, it, the prediction is you must find the Higgs particle at the, at the LHC, or some kind of Higgs particle. And indeed, we found it. There are 350 billion galaxies in the observable universe, so surely there are civilizations out there. And more advanced as well, but, Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that's the case. Sure. Uh, and, it, and it has to be the case in an infinite universe. Yeah. But if we confine ourselves to the Milky Way, which is really the only place we ever have any hope of exploring or contacting anyone, we'll never contact anyone, even in the Andromeda galaxy. But the Milky Way, if there's someone there, we could at least aspire to contact them. So it's worth that effort to listen. We don't spend much money on it, it's, we spend too little on it, I think. It would be a tremendous discovery if we made it. If so it's worth something like us. It's worth listening because, and you know, when SETI started back with Frank Drake and Carl Sagan and others back in the 60s, no planets have been discovered beyond the, beyond the solar system. None. The only planets we knew were our planets. Uh, now, as I said, the, we've discovered thousands of planets, confirmed discoveries, and the statistics tell you there are billions of them out there. So virtually every star probably has a planetary system. But as I say, you've also got to have the time to make things like us, uh, you know, and that, that's a tortuous process. There's no inevitability to evolution. The thing, it's not, it's not, a, a, it's not to be seen as some march to complexity, evolution. It's, it's, it, it, it does what it does. It, it, Single-celled organisms were very, very good at just surviving and getting on with it for, over, for most of the history of life on Earth. So it may be that complex multicellular life is kind of a, just a, an aberration, really. It's just a bit of a lucky accident. But the Big Bang is an event when space gets very hot and very dense and filled with particles. And that may happen again. Or some of the other theories 
Uh, there's a theory called eternal inflation, which is a theory that, and it's actually the most popular theory, I think, at the moment, for what happened, for why the Big Bang is the way that it is. Because it's got some very special features, the Big Bang, which we could talk about. But inflation is the idea that space, space-time was around before the Big Bang, and it was expanding extremely fast. And it was doubling in size in the most popular of these theories every 10 to the minus 37 seconds, which is point naught, 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 with 37 noughts, one of a second. So it's an unimaginably fast expansion. And then the idea is that draws to a close, so it quite naturally sort of dies away and the expansion slows down. And all the energy that was taken, that was causing that expansion, sort of gets dumped into space and heats it up and makes particles, and that's what we call the Big Bang. And those theories, the slight extension to those, um, say that, that that slowing down just happens in little patches. So most of the universe, the overwhelming majority of the universe, is still inflating at that insane sort of speed. And the just little patches stop and they're big bangs. So you get multiple universes, a multiverse. It's called the inflationary multiverse. And we are in one of those bubbles. And that's one of the more popular theories. You need to know that the Milky Way galaxy has got 200 billion stars. Most of those stars now we know have planetary systems. We estimate there are t something like 20 billion Earth-like planets, or potentially Earth-like planets, in the Milky Way galaxy alone. So if you're asking questions about what is my place in the universe, you need to know those things, first of all. It's a framework within which you can think. When you get to those numbers, when you're talking about trillions and billions and the, all those zeros, my brain just goes numb. No scientist can picture that number. I mean, he, even the small number, 200 billion, <laughs> which is the, <laughs> the number of stars number, right. in <laughs> one galaxy. And then when you say two trillion galaxies, I challenge anyone to be able to picture that. But it is the reality that we've observed. I think expansion is good, and I think we will expand, and I think we will expand outwards, because there's not much room left on this planet to expand. That's a whole different idea. It's, it's not about gathering scientific information. It's about a frontier and, and all the benefits that come from operating as a civilization on a frontier, which we've sort of lost on the Earth because there is no frontier left. And so I like that idea. When you talk about Mars, that's the only place you can go. There is no other planet we can go to other than Mars. Uh, you can't go to Jupiter or Saturn. You right. can't go to Mercury. Mercury or Venus. So if we want to go somewhere and expand our civilization, it has to be Mars and everything's there that you need. That's a different thing to saying that you want to find out stuff. If we just want to find out stuff, then you send robots. The galaxy is 100,000 light years across. There are 200 billion star systems in it. Um, it's it's big. It's too big. <laughs> but it, it, but that, that's not... So, so you could just about perhaps conceive in the far future of beginning to spread out into the Milky Way. You could conceive of that. Um, it, given hundreds of thousands of years, right? But then, if you then you go, well, where's the next galaxy, Andromeda? Right. It's two over two million light years away. So the idea that you would get across a distance of two million light years with any conceivable technology is, to me, probably. I mean, it takes light, a light beam, to two million years. So if you want to talk to someone in Andromeda. You, it will take 200, 2 million years to get a message out there and 2 million years to get it back. So there's a 4 million round trip. To, to, that's the nearest <laughs> galaxy. So, so it's, it, it's big, right? Space, that's the thing. But so, so, so you can imagine, possibly, the Milky Way. It's some chance if there are other civilizations there talking to them. But I think beyond that, I just cannot conceive of how it would be done. Is this relative, though? Uh, in, in perspective to the f single celled organisms that existed billions of years ago in comparison to us, do we really think that we're the end all be all and this is the, the last stop on the road to evolution? No. Isn't it possible that we get so advanced if we live to be another billion years that we can, all these ideas that we have in our head about the laws of space and time and the, the, the what particle physicists are trying to figure out and what string theorists are pres prescribing as far as you know 15 different dimensions is that what you said that oh, one they, they day their mind all the time. that's pretty unfair to them but <laughs> well, i want to get into that because i don't understand string theory no i don't know but i understand what you're saying either <laughs> but, but, but no you're right my, but my idea is that if if we continue to go we uh, on the same path i mean isn't it possible that we will achieve some un fathomable level of technological proficiency or, or of control over matter or of or of an understanding of the universe it's such a deep 
level that we can violate all these things that we now consider laws, like well, the laws of... Yeah, so the laws would have to be approximations to some deeper laws.